Section three is about naming and writing ionic formulas. Our goal is given the formula of an ionic compound, write the correct name, and given the name of an ionic compound, write the correct formula. We've had a little bit of an introduction to this, but the name of an ionic compound has two components. The name of the metal ion, which is written first, and it's the same as the elemental name. And the name of the non-metal ion, which is written last, and it's using the first syllable of the element's name followed by ide. And there's a space in between the metal and the non-metal's name. Let's look at a few examples of ionic compounds. Ki. K is potassium, I is iodine, so we have a potassium ion, which is our metal, our iodide ion, remember as soon as it becomes an ion, its ending changes to ide. We put the two together, it's potassium iodide. MgBr2, so we have magnesium plus two ion, we have bromide ion, giving it magnesium bromide. And then we have Al2O3. Al is aluminum, that becomes a plus three charge. How did I know aluminum was a plus three charge? Well, I looked at the periodic table and I saw that aluminum is a metal. It is right here in this metal category. And because it's a metal, it's going to give away electrons and become a plus charge. Now, what positive charge will it be? Since it is in group 3A or 13, it has one, two, three outermost electrons meaning it will give away three electrons to become a plus three charge. And oxygen becomes oxide. It has a negative two charge because oxygen is right here. It is a non-metal right here in this category, and it is two away from being like neon. It would love to grab two electrons and become a negative two charge. Now this two and this three down here does not have any impact on how we name it. We name the metal aluminum, we name the non-metal oxygen, and it turns to oxide. Can you write the name of an ionic compound with this formula? Pause the video and see if you can. Hopefully, you looked at your periodic table, and you said magnesium is the first one listed in that compound, and magnesium is a metal. So therefore, we know it's an ionic compound. We name the metal, and then we name the non-metal, and change the non-metals ending to ide. So all we need to say is magnesium, nitride. We could double check that it was written correctly. If I look at magnesium right here, I know that there is one, two outermost electrons. Magnesium would love to lose those two and become a plus two charge. And nitrogen, if we find it right here, nitrogen is a non-metal. It has five outermost electrons. It would love to gain three more, which means it would like to become a negative three ion. Let's see how this would work. Magnesium has two to give, so let's put one right there and one right here. Magnesium is now a plus two ion, and nitrogen has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Oh, this guy still needs a pair, so let's add another magnesium with two outermost electrons. One can go right there, making this nitrogen happy at a negative three, but look, we're not done. Magnesium still has one dot to give, so let's add another nitrogen. And let's put this one spare dot, how about right there, to fill that gap. This magnesium is happy, it became a plus two ion, but look, nitrogen still isn't happy. It has two more lone dots of electrons. So let's add another magnesium. One can go there, and one can go there. This magnesium's happy, this nitrogen is now happy. And let's count. We have one, two, three magnesiums. Notice that this is Mg3. And one, two nitrogens. Two nitrogens. Three magnesiums, two nitrogens. Let's double check that our compound is neutral. If I have three magnesiums, if I have three positive two charges, that overall is positive six. And if I have two nitrogens, each nitrogen is negative three, so two negative threes is negative six. Look at that, positive six plus negative six is a neutral compound. We have seen so far that the charge of an ion of a representative element can be obtained from its group number. And when we say a representative element, that means, is it from the alkali metals? So does it have a plus one charge? Is it the alkaline earth metals? Does it have a plus two charge? Or is it over here in group 3 or 13 and have a plus 3 charge? These are our representative or our A, group 1A, group 2A, group 3A. Those are our representative 
elements. However, we cannot determine the charge of a transition element because it typically forms two or more positive ions. The transition elements lose electrons, but they are lost from the highest energy level and sometimes from a lower energy level as well. This is also true for metals of representative elements in groups 4A and 5A like lead, tin, and bismuth. And when we say the transition metals, we mean these guys, the Bs, and the lead, tin, and bismuth right here. So here are some examples. In some ionic compounds, iron is in the form of Fe plus 2, but in others, it can form a plus 3 ion. Copper can also form two different ions, plus 1 and a plus 2 ion. When a metal can form two or more types of ions, it has what's called a variable charge. So we can't predict the ionic charge from the group number if it's a transition metal or if it's a couple of those special ones right here, the tin, lead, and bismuth. We do use a naming system used to identify the particular cation if it's one of those metals that form two or more ions. We use what's called a Roman numeral that tells us the ionic charge, and that's put in parentheses right after the name of the metal. For example, if we were told that we had iron in plus two form forming with chlorine to form iron two chloride, we would write iron in parentheses two, Roman numerals. Iron three would be iron, and then Roman numeral three is just one, two, three. If I wanted to do iron four, I'm not saying that there is an iron four, uh, there's a lead four, but we would say IV, and five is a V. So this is four, this is five, and then to do six is VI. Not that you'll need to go that high, but just make sure that you understand Roman numerals. Roman numeral one is just one, two is two of them, three, and then this is four, five, and six. The transition elements form more than one positive ion, except, here's our exceptions. Zinc is always just zinc, with a plus two ion. Cadmium is always cadmium plus two, and silver is always Ag plus. They only form one. So we would not write zinc two. No, we don't need to, for these three are the exceptions. So no Roman numerals are used with those when we are naming ionic compounds. And then we already said that those couple of examples from groups 14 and 15 or 4 and 5a can form ions of plus 2 and plus 4 for lead and tin, and bismuth will form plus 3 and plus 5. Here are some of those metals that can form more than one positive ion. Bismuth, like we said, can form plus 3 and plus 5, and we would show that by Roman numeral 3 and 5. Chromium can form plus 2 and plus 3, 2 and 3 there. Cobalt has two positive ions that can form. Copper has two. Gold, gold forms plus one and plus three. Iron plus two and plus three. Lead can form two, two and four. Manganese, mercury, nickel, and tin. And this just shows us the metals with variable charges. It shows us the ones that have multiple ions that it forms but it also shows us the ones that don't have multiple, like the zinc and the cadmium and the silver, even though they're transition metals. And it also shows us that group one is always plus one, group two is always plus two, aluminum is always plus three, these guys are always minus three, minus two, minus one. Let's look at this problem. Antifouling paint contains Cu2O, which prevents the growth of barnacles and algae on the bottoms of boats. What is the name of Cu2O? Because copper is one of those elements that can have different charges, we don't know how many valence electrons it has that it's going to give away. But if we don't know one, we always will know the other. So let's look at our periodic table and look at oxygen. Oxygen is right here. It's in group six, so it has six outermost electrons. Oxygen always wants to become a negative two ion. So if we drew six in this tells me that I have one oxygen in this compound. Right now I have one oxygen and there are two coppers. See how that Cu2? So there's two coppers in this compound, meaning there must be one electron coming from this copper and one electron coming from this copper. 
So each copper must have one electron, making it a plus one charge and this oxygen becoming a minus two. So each copper has a plus one charge. We would name this copper one oxide. Let me show you another trick. Think back to when we wrote magnesium chloride. We found that magnesium on the periodic table formed a plus two ion because it had two outermost electrons. And chlorine had seven. It wants one more. It becomes a negative one ion. Look at this little trick. If I just take the number and do a crisscross, the charge that it becomes without the positive or the negative will tell me how many of the other element we need in this compound. So the fact that chlorine becomes a negative one charge tells me that I need one magnesium and this positive two tells me that I need two chlorines. We can also use this to our advantage if I want to name a compound that has multiple charges, like we said, FeCl2, we know chlorine is always a negative one. Iron could have multiple charges. We could look at this and say, oh right, there is one iron. So this too, let's do a reverse crisscross. Fe must be a plus two charge. We could draw it out just like we did the last one. We know that we have two chlorines and one Fe. FeCl2 is one iron and two chlorines. Here's our one iron and two chlorines. Each chlorine has seven valence electrons. Each chlorine wants one electron. This chlorine wants one electron. So this iron must have two electrons that it's willing to give. Giving iron a plus two charge, each chlorine is a negative one charge. We would name this iron two chloride. Let's look at another example, Fe2O3. Let me show you the long way and then let me show you the shortcut. We don't know what iron charge this is, but we again will always know the other one. We know oxygen becomes a negative two charge. It's a negative two charge, that means it wants to gain two electrons. So I just drew out three oxygens, one, two, three, each oxygen has six outermost electrons. So each oxygen wants two electrons. That would be six total electrons that it wants between two irons. So if it needs six electrons and there's two irons, each iron must have three outermost electrons. It can give one there, one there, that oxygen is happy, one there, that iron is now happy at a plus three, and then this iron can give one electron there, one there, one there. Each iron is a plus three charge. Each oxygen is a negative two charge. Everybody's happy. Again, we could reverse crisscross. Knowing this compound formula, Fe2O3, I could take this two and just double check, reverse crisscross. Yep, oxygen has a negative two charge. This three came from iron's charge. That must be a plus three. So we would name that iron three oxide. It always pays to double check to make sure that we have a neutral compound when we are finding the charges of one of the metals. Let's double check. If we think that it's a plus three charge, plus three times two would be plus six, and three times negative two is negative six. Yes, it's a neutral compound. I encourage you to go through these and do one of these methods to figure out the name for those remaining compounds. This is just a review. Ionic compound formulas are written from the first part of the name, which describes the metal, including its charge, the second part of the name, which specifies the nonmetals, and then we have those subscripts that balances our charge. Why don't you try writing the formula for iron three chloride? That three tells me that I have a positive three charge for my iron. We know chloride is chlorine with a negative one charge. Therefore, I can take my Fe plus three and the Cl minus one, and I can crisscross these charges. And I have one iron and three chlorines, FeCl3. We could also draw this out. If I have Fe with three outermost electrons and chlorine has seven, we know that chlorine can only accept one electron from iron before it's full at negative one. Therefore, we must need a second chlorine and a third chlorine to give away each of those iron electrons, giving me three chlorines and one iron. Take a minute to look over the learning goal from this section to make sure that you are good to go.